Hi and welcome back to Program Analysis. This is video number two in the lecture on path profiling. And what we'll do in this um, second video is to look at the Ball Laros algorithm, which is an algorithm to address the path profiling problem, which um, I've introduced in the first video. The way we look at this algorithm here in this video is by looking at it for uh, DAGs, so for directed acyclic graphs, which means we do not look at arbitrary control flow graphs yet. I'll leave this for the third video, but at a slightly simpler problem, um, simply because it's easier to explain the algorithm like this. But we'll see in the third video how to actually generalize it to arbitrary graphs. So let me start by giving you a one slide summary of this uh, ball Laros algorithm. By the way, the algorithm is called like this because it has been invented by Tom Ball and Jim Laros, um, two computer scientists who um, are interested in compilers and, um, and, and related topics. So um, in a nutshell, the algorithm works as follows. So it starts by assigning a number to each path through our graph. So basically each of the paths that you can take through a control flow graph um, has one number. Then um, it computes this number while going through the graph by incrementing a counter at every branching point. So essentially, um, we start at the entry node and then at, at branching points increment the counter such that at the end we can tell from the sum of these increments which of the paths we have actually taken. And the way this is done um, has two very nice properties. One is that um, this path encoding is precise, meaning that there's a single unique encoding for each um, path through our graph. And it's also, um, or it can be computed in a way that is minimal, which means that um, the algorithm instruments the minimal uh, subset of edges, um, or more precisely, the, a subset of edges that uh, imposes minimal cost. So we get a precise um, path at the end, but um, have um, some proof that this is actually imposing the least possible overhead. So let me illustrate this idea using the running example that we've already introduced in the first uh, video of this lecture. So here's our control flow graph again. And now what the algorithm is doing is to basically add some instrumentation to the normal execution of this program. Specifically, um, there are two kinds of instrumentation that are added. So one of them is that we're adding um, some state or more precisely a counter that um, is the number that we are summing up in order to get the path encoding. And let's just call this R. And then we also have um, an array of all the counts that we are producing where basically every path through the program has one entry in this array and the value at this entry um, corresponds to how often we've seen this path being executed. And we call this array counts. And now given these two um, pieces of instrumentation, um, I'll just show you what the algorithm will produce on this example control flow graph here. Um, and then later we will see how to actually get to um, these numbers that I'm adding here. So, for this example, what the algorithm would do is to um, initialize our uh, counter R to zero if this edge is taken, the one from A to C. It would initialize the counter to um, two if we take the edge from B to C. Or if we take the edge from B to D, then it will initialize R to four. And then on the edge from D to E, it would take whatever R currently is, and just increment this value by adding one to it. And then when we reach the end of the program, our exit node F, we access our count array at index R, and then just increment whatever value is there to um, indicate that the path represented by um, the value R has been executed another time. So now given this instrumentation, let's have a look at our six paths again. So all the different ways one can go from A to F. And let's have a look what um, yeah, encoding they would get. So which number is basically computed by adding or initializing R. Um, so let's start with the first path here, which is this ACDF path. So if we start at A and then go to C, we will set uh, R to zero. Next, we go from C to D and then from D to F. Um, which is also um, 
uh, already the end of our um, program or our code that is represented here. And because R is still zero, that means that the encoding of R will be number zero. Now let's look at the second path, ACDEF. So for this one, we also initialize um, R to zero here, then go from C to D, from D to E, where we add one onto our existing value of R. So R will now be one. And then from E we go to F, so at the end the encoding of this path is 1. Um, in a similar way, let's have a look at the third one, A, B, C, D, F. So A, B, um, C makes us take this edge, so we initialize um, R to 2, then go to D and then to F, so we do not change R anymore, and therefore the encoding is 2. For the next one, A, B, C, D, E, F, we will... Um, initialize R to 2 and then also take this edge here which means that we at the end will have the encoding 3 and now let's also have a look at the two remaining ones ABDF so for ABDF we will path through this edge and then not change R anymore so this path is encoded with um, this value 4 and the final one um, will go through this edge and also through that edge which means that the encoding at the end is five. So what you can see is that every path gets one and only one unique encoding. And we get this by only um, executing these few statements that we've added to the original programs, which sometimes initialize a value or increment a value. And at the end of the um, code that we are profiling, um, just takes this added up value and uses it as an encoding of the path that has been executed. So now I may ask, well, wonderful, how do we get these uh, blue instrumentation statements? Because they seem to exactly do what we want. And this is what I'm going to tell you next. Uh, and before doing that, let me just state a few assumptions um, that I'm making here while explaining the algorithm. Um, so first of all, the algorithm is not explained for arbitrary control flow graphs, but only for, for DAX, so directed acyclic graphs. And we'll see later on how to lift these restrictions. The second assumption is that we have n paths through this graph and they are simply numbered from 0 to n minus 1, just as we've seen it in the example. Um, another assumption is that our graph has a unique entry and exit node, um, which um, is a simple to fulfill um, assumption if the graph doesn't look like this anyway, because we can always add another entry node or another exit node um, if needed. And finally, um, we assume that um, there is an artificial back edge from the exit node to the entry node, which actually breaks the first assumption that the graph is acyclic. But um, for this artificial back edge, um, this is um, uh, yeah, basically an exception from this assumption um, to make the overall algorithm work. So let's just illustrate these assumptions using the example graph that we have here. So first of all, this graph is indeed acyclic. And the reason simply is that there's no um, cycle in here, so there's no um, loop or anything that brings us back to one of the nodes that we have already seen earlier. Then um, we do have a unique entry node and also a unique, unique exit node. So this one A is the one and only entry node where we um, start the execution of the code. And this one node F is our unique exit node. And then the last assumption was that we have this um, artificial back edge from the exit node to the entry node, which um, I'm adding here. So this one um, will be this artificial back edge that we'll use in the algorithm. All right, so now having stated these assumptions, let's have a look at the algorithm, which essentially consists of two main steps. So step number one um, will assign integers to each of the edges that we have in our graph. And the goal of this first step is um, to assign these integers in such a way that the sum along the um, a particular path yields a unique number for this path. So basically we want to get this number that represents the encoding of the path. And this first step alone is enough to reach the precision goal that um, the algorithm has. So um, by just 
performing this first step, we know for sure that every path will have um, a unique number. Now, the second goal was to um, also impose minimal effort while um, computing this encoding of every path and while keeping track of how often that path is executed. And in order to do this, the second step of the algorithm is to assign increment operations to edges in a way that um, does not just um, use this integer for every edge, but basically tries to reduce the number of increment operations and initialization operations that we need. So the goal here is to minimize the additions um, that are actually performed along the edges. And in order to do this, um, the algorithm will only instrument a subset of all edges that we have in our graph. Now, in order to know how to minimize the actual effort, um, you need to make some assumptions about how often these edges are executed, because ideally you want to add instrumentation to those edges that are not executed very often, because then um, these increment operations will impose um, the smallest possible overhead. And to do this, um, we somehow assume that we know how often um, each edge is executed. For example, this is a piece of information we could get from the edge profiling approach that we've talked about in the first video of this lecture. So now let's have a look at the first part of this algorithm in some more detail, um, where we want to compute this integer value um, for every edge, such that the sum of the um, edge values um, that um, um, are along a path gives us this encoding of the path, so this unique value that identifies the path. In order to do this, what the algorithm does first is to um, associate a value with each node in the graph, and we call this value num paths, which stands for the number of paths from this node n to the exit. So in order to compute this num paths, the algorithm does the following. So it visits every node in the graph in reverse topological order. Reverse topological order just means that we start at the end and then um, visit nodes by going backwards such that we never visit a node before having visited um, all of its successors. And so while going through the graph in this order, um, we distinguish two cases. If n is a leaf node, so if it's um, basically a node that does not have any um, successors, which means it's um, it's one of the, uh, or it's the unique exit node, then we set num paths to one. And otherwise, um, we set num paths to the sum of the num paths of the destinations of all the outgoing edges of the node. So basically, if I'm at some node and the two outgoing edges, uh, let's say one has num path of three, the other one has num path of four, then when I'm here, I basically have seven ways to go to the exit because I could go this way and get the three from here, or I could go that way and then get the four from here. So together, um, this gives seven. So this is the basic idea of computing these uh, num paths. This value num path is of course only a helper value um, on the way to computing the uh, integer value for every edge that we actually want to compute. So just as a reminder, this um, integer value should be such that we can add up the integer values of all edges along a path to get the unique encoding of that path. And here's the algorithm that shows how to compute this integer value and at the same time compute this helper value um, called num paths. So what this algorithm does is the following. It visits um, all nodes in reverse topological order and then distinguishes two cases. If the node is a leaf node, so basically if that's our exit node, then we only initialize num path and we initialize it to one because by definition we say there's one path to the exit if we are at the exit. And in the other case, so if n is some other node, uh, we do the following. We first initialize the num path value of this node to zero. And then we visit all the edges that go out of this current node n, so all edges from n to some other node m, and do two, two things. First, we set the value associated with this edge to the current value of num paths of n, and then um, we increment num paths with the num paths of the target node m. And then we do this for the remaining edges so that at the end, every um, edge outgoing of n has some value associated um, with it. So let's illustrate this algorithm and this way of computing an edge value for each edge in our graph using our running example again. So what you see here is just the control flow graph that we've seen before. And now we want to visit each node in this graph 
in reverse topological order. So essentially what this means is that we want to make sure that we visit um, every successor of a node n before visiting n itself. So for our example here, that means we're starting at the exit node F and then um, the question is, do we visit D or E at first? If we would visit D next, then we would um, have visited D before we have visited um, one of its successors because we haven't seen E yet. So that means we need to first go to E and then can go to D. Now, Going backward from D, we can look at um, B and C. And here it's a similar argument as before. So we first need to visit um, C and can then visit B in order to make sure that um, we've visited every successor of B before visiting B itself. And then finally, as the last node, um, we can visit our node A. So now um, let's go through this algorithm step by step. And while doing this, I will do two things. One is I will write down the uh, num paths for each of the nodes that we are visiting. And at the same time, um, and for this I will use blue color, I will write down the values that this algorithm is associating with the different edges of the graph. So the first node we are visiting is node F. And looking at the algorithm, um, this is the first um, uh, of the two branches that we have here because uh, node F is actually a leaf node and therefore we set numpaths of F to 1. Next we are visiting node E. E is not a leaf node so we will go into the else branch and that means we start by initializing numpaths with uh, 0 and then we are visiting each of the edges that are going out of E so there's only one in this case which goes from e to f and for this one we will set the value of the edge to the current numpaths of n so the current numpaths of e which means um, we set the value of this edge here oops wrong color to um, zero like this and then we are incrementing the current numpaths of e by adding the numpaths of the destination node of f which is one so we will um, set Instead of having zero here, we will put a one, and this is the um, also the final numpaths of this node E. Next, we're visiting node D. Again, D is not a leaf node, so we will initialize its numpaths value with zero and then go through all the edges um, of this node. This node D has two outgoing edges. Um, let's just first visit the one that goes from D to F, um, which means we will associate um, with this edge the current value of, um, of numpath of D. So we will put a zero here. And then after that, um, we look at the second statement that we need to execute for every edge, which is to increment the current numpaths of the source node of D by adding the current numpaths of the destination node of F, which means we're adding one to this value here, and then numpath of D is zero. Now we've only visited the first outgoing edge of D, but there's also the other one that goes from D to E. Um, also for this one, we look at the current numpaths of D and use this as the value for this edge. So we put a one here. And then we again increment numpaths of D with the numpaths value of the destination node of E, which means we will add another one here and at the end have numpaths of D equal to two. Next we are visiting node C and here um, it's again not a leaf node, so again we initialize numpaths um, to one, then visit one, the one and only outgoing edge that C has, which is this one, and label it with the current numpaths, and then um, add the numpaths of the destination, so the numpaths of D, which is two, 
to our current value, which means um, numpads of C will at the end also be two. The next node to visit is node B. Um, again, not a leaf node, so we initialize numpaths to zero and then go through the outgoing edges. There are two of them. Let's say we are visiting the one that goes from B to C first. Um, that means we will um, set the value of this edge from B to C to the current numpaths of B, which is zero. And after that increment numpaths with the num numpaths of C, so this means we set this value to two. And then look at the other edge where we um, label the, the edge with the current numpaths of B, meaning two, and then add to the numpaths of B the numpaths of D, which means this two here becomes a four. And then finally, there's only one node left to be visitors, visited, and this is node A, which again is not a leaf node. Again, we initialize this numpaths to zero and then go through the two outgoing edges, where for the first one, we'll um, set this values, uh, this, this edge here, to um, zero and then increment um, the current numpath of A with the numpaths of C. So with um, we add two and then put this value as the edge value on the next edge and then add the numpaths of B to numpaths of A. So we have two plus four, which at the end gives us six. And this is um, the final result that we get from this algorithm. So now we have every edge associated with um, some number. And if you now look at um, these edge numbers, you'll see that each of them is chosen such that if you go through some path, you'll get a unique number that um, identifies this path, which is exactly what we wanted to have in the first part of the ball arrows algorithm. Now to check if this idea was um, clear enough, um, I'll have a little quiz for you, which is a slightly different graph from the graphs that we've seen so far. So it looks very similar to the one that we had before, but the big difference is that there's no edge here between B and C. And now what I would like you to do is to basically do the same algorithm that I've just done on this graph in order to compute the values that need to be associated with these edges. So basically the question is, um, what will be here? And in order to do this, um, you'll need to decide in which order to visit these nodes and what numpath values to associate, it, uh, to associate with each of these nodes. As a little hint, um, I will tell you that the sum of the different um, numpath values, if you go through all nodes, um, should be 12. And then another hint to, um, for you to check whether your solution is correct is that once you have associated um, values with each of the edges in the graph, you can go through all the four paths that this graph has and check if each of them has a different sum so that um, each path is labeled with um, some value between zero and three. So there should be a value, uh, a path value, uh, a path labeled with one, a path labeled with two, a path labeled with three, and um, that should cover all, all paths. So at this point, please stop the video for uh, a moment and just try it out yourself to see if you've really understood it. And if anyone doesn't really know the solution or isn't sure um, whether the solution is correct, feel free to um, ask a question in Ilias. All right, so now we've seen the first part of this algorithm where we have computed um, an integer value for each of the edges such that the sum along a path yields a unique number for every path. And now the second step of the algorithm wants to um, minimize the effort that is needed to increment um, values when edges are actually taken at runtime based on some uh, information about how frequent these individual edges are actually executed. So we'll now look into this second step and we'll see how the algorithm addresses that second problem. For the second part of this algorithm, we need to introduce some new terminology. And this terminology um, is um, from the uh, graph uh, th theory field, and this is the idea of a spanning tree. So given some graph um, G, 
A spanning tree is essentially an undirected subgraph of the given graph G that is a tree and at the same time contains all nodes that um, we have in the graph G. And then once you have um, found such a spanning tree, there's another term, namely the so-called chord edges. And those are all the edges that are in our original graph G, but that are not part of the spanning tree T. Now, as an example to illustrate this idea of spanning trees, um, let's just have a look at our um, graph that we've used as a running example throughout this lecture. Um, and this one will be our original graph G in this case. So here it is again. And now in addition to the edges that we've used all the time, I'll also use the artificial back edge that we have introduced earlier when I talked about the assumption that the algorithm makes. And now I'm giving you a couple of examples of potential spanning trees. And the question for you is, which of these examples is actually a spanning tree of G? All right, so here are the examples. Um, there are five of them. Um, for each example, I have not repeated the names of the nodes, but just put these little circles, but I guess you can uh, basically see which node I mean. And then between the nodes, there are some edges. And now the question is, given um, the requirements that we have for a spanning tree, which of these are actual spanning trees? Now let's have a quick look back at these requirements. So essentially what we want to have here is that, um, the um, spanning tree must be an undirected subgraph of G um, and it must be a tree and it must contain, contain all nodes of the original graph. So now given these requirements, um, we can see that this first candidate is actually not a spanning tree simply because it does not um, contain this one node here. So um, number one is not a spanning tree. In contrast, number two is a spanning tree. So this one is fine. Um, because it does contain all nodes, it is a tree, and um, yeah, it's an undirected subgraph of G. Um, number three does also contain all nodes, but um, it's problematic because we have a circle here, so this means um, this one is actually not um, a tree. In contrast, number four is fine, because even though it looks a bit weird, it is a tree, and it uh, contains all nodes of our graph. And the same is true for candidate number five, which is another spanning tree of our original graph G. So as you can see here, there's possibly more than one spanning tree of a given graph, um, and each of them must include all the nodes of the original graph. So now given this idea of a spanning tree, we can use this to find a way to increment just a subset of all the edges of our graph so that we still um, have um, this property that the sum of the edges along a path gives you a unique encoding of the path. And now the idea here is the following. So we start by choosing among the different spanning trees of the graph, that spanning tree that maximizes the edge costs. So basically we look at the costs of the individual edges that would be part of a spanning tree and then just sum them. And if this is uh, the maximum across all spanning trees of the given graph, then that's the spanning tree that we want to have. Now those are the edges that we do not want to instrument because they are um, the most expensive ones. And instead what we do is we will then increment um, um, our, our counter only at the chords of the spanning tree. So exactly at those edges that are not part of the spanning tree. And um, in order to, um, yeah, and, and then by doing this, um, we basically get increments at exactly those places of the program that are executed the least often, but where we still at the end um, get um, this nice property that um, the sum of the edge values um, is a unique encounting, uh, encoding for the path through um, our graph. So let me illustrate this idea again using our running example. So here you again see our graph, including the artificial back edge. And now we um, make the assumption that we know the cost of individual edges. So we have some idea of, for example, how often each of these edges um, is executed. So let's assume 
Um, we have these values as our known edge cost. And then based on these known edge costs, the next thing we can do is to think about the most expensive spanning tree um, of this given graph. And if you do this and try out a couple of um, spanning trees, you will find the following. Namely that um, this spanning tree, so I'm basically labeling those edges that um, are part of the tree and I'm omitting all the others, that this one is the one that maximizes the overall cost of the involved edges. Now using this most expensive spanning tree, what we know want to do is to find minimal increments. So we need to basically only increment some of the edges that are not expensive um, in this graph. But first let's have a look at the um, increments that we had computed earlier and that are not necessarily the minimal ones. So these non-minimal increments are just what we had uh, computed earlier. So let me just go back a few slides. Um, so these blue values that we had computed here as the values of the edges, this is what I'm now using again. So I'm just putting them here onto our graph again. So we had two, two and one here and all the others are zero. But now we do not want to make these increment operations on edges that are um, among the expensive ones. So we do not want to make them on those red edges that you see on the left, but instead we want to make them on the court edges. So those edges that are not part of this most expensive um, spanning tree. So looking at the spanning tree, this means we want to ideally increment on this edge, on this edge, on this edge, and on that edge, but not on the others. So now in order to do this, so to only have increment operations on these green chord edges, we need to move around these increment operations while still preserving um, the property that every path has a unique encoding. And the algorithm to do this is something that I will not show here in the lecture, simply because um, yeah, there's not enough time to really cover also that algorithm, but um, just believe me that there is an existing algorithm that does it. And essentially what it computes at the end are these minimal increments that look as follows. So we um, will have some increment here, which doesn't really increment anything. So this is just zero. We will put an increment of two here, um, of four here and of one here. And now you may recognize these numbers because this is exactly what I've shown you at um, the very beginning, where we have said that this is actually the path encoding that we would like to get and where we had already seen at the beginning that this um, is indeed a path encoding that gives every path um, from A to F a unique number. Good, so now you know how to compute these minimal increments uh, in theory. Let's have a quick look at how this is typically implemented. So how to actually instrument a program in order to then really compute the encoding for the path and to then also count how often each path has been executed. So the basic idea is that um, at the entry into our control flow graph, we are initializing this variable R that stores the sum of the um, edge values that um, are executed. And we initialize this um, value to uh, to zero. And then on all edges that have an increment, we add uh, a piece of code that actually represents this uh, increment by adding some value um, to our counter R. And then at the exit of the um, entire um, graph, we need to increment the uh, count for this path by basically using the value of R that we have at the end as the index into this array count, which stores the counts for the different paths in the program. So that's the basic idea. I know um, every basic idea can be optimized uh, even further. So there are two optimizations that one can do 
here. One is that instead of incrementing, uh, sorry, instead of initializing this value r at the very beginning, um, where we just set it to zero, we can actually um, save this effort and only initialize it to the already incremented value at the first um, edge that is taken on a path. Um, so we do not initialize it to zero, but initialize it to the first value that it gets on um, the corresponding edge. And we can also optimize a little further um, at the end. So instead of doing this increment um, at the very end, we can combine this with the last um, increment of R that happens by basically putting um, this kind of instruction at this last edge um, through the graph where we increment both R with some value and then also um, our counter for the corresponding path. So now you may wonder, once we have this encoding and this array count that tells us for every encoding how often um, it has occurred, how do we actually get the path? So how do we regenerate the path from a given encoding? And here, um, the idea is the following. So if we um, say that this sum, this encoding is uh, lowercase r, then what we do is the following. We use um, the edge values that we have from the first step of the algorithm. So basically these non-minimal increments. And then um, we start at the entry of the graph with um, some helper value capital R equal to our sum uh, lowercase r. And then we go through the graph until we reach the exit. And at every branch, so basically every time we need to decide which way we go, we um, take the edge that has the largest value associated with this edge that is still smaller or equal than our capital R and then just remove this value from our capital R. And we do this until we reach the end and then we've taken a path and this is exactly the path that is represented by the encoding lowercase r. So let's again illustrate this idea um, using the running example. So what you see here is the graph that you've already seen all the time plus the non-minimal um, increments for these edges that we um, have computed earlier. And now let's suppose that we have um, one of these encodings, let's say um, value four, and we want to know which path this encoding corresponds to. So what we do is um, we have this helper um, variable capital R, which we initialize with the um, encoding that we have, so with four. And then we start at the um, entry node of our graph. And then whenever we have to decide between two paths, like for example here, whether we go to B or to C, we use the edge that has the largest value that still fits into our helper value um, uppercase um, R. So in this case, this would be this edge. So that means we basically go um, to uh, from A to B, and then we um, decrement uh, uppercase R with the edge value. So we this means we um, subtract two and have two remaining. Now we are at B. And here again, we have to decide, do we go to C or do we go to D? And again, we take that edge that has the largest value that still fits into our um, capital R here, which means we will take the one that goes um, down to D, which means our next node on the path is D. And we again remove the value of this edge from um, our uppercase R, meaning we have only zero left here. And now when we are at edge D, we in principle could again decide between um, going to E or to F, but since we have only zero left here in our uppercase R, um, the only choice that we have is to take the edge directly to F. And this gives us the um, path that is associated with this uh, encoding of four. Now, just as a, another example, let's assume that our encoding is one. Um, then we do the same. So we take this one as kind of the guess that we can use on our um, way to the exit. Now we are here um, we cannot go to B because that would cost us two, but we have only one left. So what we do um, is instead to go to C. Now, once we are at C, there's only one option. We go to uh, D. And now at D, we have two options. We could go um, down to E, and this is also what we do. But as a result, we have to remove um, one from our remaining um, number. So we have then E, and from E, there's only one way out, 
which is um, 2f. So this is the path that corresponds to encoding 1. All right, and this is the end of uh, video number two in this lecture on uh, path profiling. So you've now seen the core of the ball Laros algorithm, which is um, a way to address this path profiling problem that is um, both correct, so it always gives a unique encoding for every path, and efficient because it guarantees that the cost for the increment operations um, is minimal. Thank you very much for listening and see you in the next video.